What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And I'm back and better than ever today. Better than ever. The last video going over my top 12 running backs for the upcoming redraft season in fantasy football was so, so incredibly well received. The comments were so overwhelmingly positive that I decided to run it back with not my RB1s for the upcoming season, but with my RB2s, RB13 through 24 for the upcoming redraft season. Uh, let's just go ahead and get into it right now. Uh, my RB24 is Javante Williams. He's currently being drafted as the RB28 over on Underdog, so I guess this makes me a Javante Williams stand for the first time in my career. I'm assuming he plays 13 games this season. That's what I have in as like a placeholder games played um, in my projections with like a little ramp up for the first two or three weeks in his usage um, as he kind of, you know, gets back healthy and, you know, ramps up to full uh, to full go. But if he's healthy beyond that, like he, he projects out as my RB10 on a points per game basis this season. If he's healthy, I'm not, I mean, I could do a different version of the projections and different version of the rankings um, that assumes he's going to be not healthy, but if he's playing a partial season uh, and then is good to go once he's kind of acclimated after a few weeks, I see him producing like an RB1 at that point, even with a decent split in the backfield bet between him, Javante Williams, and Samaj P. Ryan. Like, I, he doesn't need to be, you know, super dominant as far as handling a bunch of the touches in this Denver backfield goes, mostly because I believe that Denver is set up to absolutely feed their running backs in the passing game this season. Denver was eighth in the league in targets to running backs last year. Um, obviously, this offense is very different um, now with, you know, Sean Payton um, involved and things like that. But just going off of, you know, what happened in this offense with this, you know, similar personnel, Russell Wilson was the quarterback. Um, they were eighth in running back targets last season with, you know, Latavius Murray and Melvin Gordon as their RB1 and RB2 over the, the whole season stretch. And over 23% of Russell Wilson's attempts last season went to running backs. That's a ridiculous, like almost a quarter, obviously. That, that's a ridiculously high number. Sean Payton is the head coach. He's obviously heavily used running backs in the passing game going back 20 years uh, we know about his history with the Saints, even with the Giants. Tiki Barber saw more than 90, or at least 95 targets in three straight seasons with Sean Payton as his offensive coordinator back in the early 2000s. And then it was, you know, just a bunch of 80 to 100 target seasons for guys like Darren Sproles and Pierre Thomas and Reggie Bush and Alvin Kamara, like some of them happening at the same time as each other. This is an offensive architect who likes to use running backs in the passing game and always has. And Joe Lombardi is their offensive coordinator now. And most recently... Well, he was with he was with Sean Payton in the past um, in New Orleans. Most recently, was coordinating offenses with the Chargers that saw Austin Eckler targeted, what ninety four and one hundred twenty seven times in the last two seasons. And he also coordinated offenses in Detroit in twenty fourteen and twenty fifteen, in which in twenty fourteen. Uh, Reggie Bush, Joyke Bell, and Theo Riddick all had 50 or more targets. And in 2015, Theo Riddick had 99 targets on his own. Like, this is an offense, just tons of factors converging here of, like, people who love to target running backs in the passing game with Russell Wilson, who did it a lot last year. Sean Payton, who's always done it a lot. Joe Lombardi, who's always done it a lot. Last year, Javante Williams had a 15% target share before getting hurt. Yeah, a lot of that was, you know, a bunch of checkdowns in that first game against Seattle, but A, that happened, and B, even if you want to say, okay, that was an outlier game, he had five targets and four targets in the next two weeks before getting one target in the game in which he got hurt and didn't play the whole game. So five targets and four, like four and a half targets a game projects out to, what is that? Like we're pushing 70 targets in a season for Javante Williams, even without factoring in Sean Payton and Joe Lombardi and all that. I'm currently projecting him for 65 targets, 51 receptions in 13 games, and obviously, yes, it's very possible that he's just not healthy, just not right, not good to go this season after the knee injury last year, but RB24 feels like a decent spot to bet on his upside. He's falling in drafts, I get it. I'm not even a massive Javante Williams fan, but like, if he's healthy and ready to go, even by midseason, you're going to get good production out of him, and you're going to be happy you drafted him as a back-end RB2. Uh, my RB23 is Kenneth Walker, who's currently being drafted as the RB16. He finishes the RB16 on a per-game basis last season with a 65% share 
of carries in the Seattle backfield. Zach Charbonnet was drafted in the second round to the same team that Kenneth Walker is on. You you may have missed this, but Zach Charbonnet was taken in the second round. Is on the same team now. So that's, you know, what's going to happen to Kenneth Walker's workload now? I'm projecting him for a 65% carry share. I feel like I'm being pretty conservative with the degree to which I anticipate Zach Charbonnet eating into his rushing workload. And I'm also giving Kenneth Walker an efficiency boost on a per carry basis. I have him at 4.85 yards per carry in my projections. He averaged like 4.6 last season. So seeing a decent jump up, and he was very inconsistent on a down-to-down basis last year, I see him improving in that category after he was awesome in college, you know, some growing pains as a rookie. I expect him to be better on the ground, but I don't see how he earns enough pass-catching opportunities to finish near RB1 range when Charbonnet is presumably going to serve as the third down running back in this offense. He was a much more productive, much more competent pass catcher in college than Kenneth Walker was. Uh, Kenneth Walker was one of the worst running backs in the league on a per target basis last season after not being efficient and not being productive in the passing game in college. Like It just seems like Charbonnet is set up to play the third down role. And on top of that, like they now have Jackson Smith and Jigba, uh, making their offense, you know, giving their offense one of the best three wide sets in the entire league. Like, I don't see why Kenneth Walker would now increase his usage in the passing game versus what we saw from last year. Like, they're probably going to throw the ball. Like, I just don't see how he's going to finish near RB1 range. Uh, Charbonnet is going to eat into the rushing workload, maybe even more than I have projected. Like Kenneth Walker, don't love him this season. My RB22 is David Montgomery. He's not going to run as hot at the goal line as Jamal Williams did last season in this same role. Uh, Hard to ask that of anybody. Tons of opportunities, tons of touchdowns for Jamal Williams. Uh, But David Montgomery should be able to score like 10 times in this offense. He's going to have the goal line role. Um, He's going to punch some of them in. And I also think he's going to catch more passes than Jamal Williams did last season, who was, I don't remember how many, he got like 18 or something. David Montgomery has been a a functional pass catcher throughout his career. One of the one of the underrated aspects I think of them bringing in Jameer Gibbs, who is not a great inside runner I don't think, but is is probably more reliable there than DeAndre Swift was who made a lot of, you know, frustrating decisions behind the line of scrimmage. Jameer Gibbs will probably be less frustrating and therefore more reliable in between the tackles on a carry to carry basis. And David Montgomery offers more in the passing game than Jamal Williams did. I think they're going to be able to to mix and match a little bit more with their running backs this year than they have been in the past with the with with you know the Swift Williams backfield. So David Montgomery is going to catch a decent amount of passes. I could see 35, 30 receptions. His efficiency has gone down in each of the last couple of years, and he's now 26 years old. There's some risk that he's washed, but like Jamal Williams uh, was running like he was, you know, from an efficiency standpoint, was running like he was washed last season uh, and still was productive. And Like, I don't think he needs to be super dynamic or super explosive to get the work he needs to get in this offense in order to score touchdowns and just be on the field enough to catch passes. David Montgomery feels really safe to me un- unless... He's completely washed. I don't really see that happening this season. Uh, My RB21 is Cam Akers. I'm conservative. This feels conservative. I'm conservatively projecting him for like a 65% carry share in the Rams backfield. Uh, Less than a 6% target share also. Uh, Both of those might be too low. 6% target share for a running back is very low. That puts him at like 25 receptions for the season. And there's not much to speak of behind him in this running back room. I'm a big Zach Evans fan, and I think there's some sneaky possibility that Zach Evans eats into this workload significantly or is as good as Cam Akers is, but I'm not projecting that. I'm, I'm projecting Zach Evans to be like a, you know, 90, 100 carry RB2 and, and Cam Akers to touch the ball on the ground 200, 225 times, approaching 250 times, even with these, these carry share and target share numbers that I have set pretty low, I think. But even those give him like mid RB2 numbers. And if Zach Evans doesn't emerge as like a legitimate breather back behind him, the the other options are like Kyron Williams, Ronnie Rivers, and Sony Michelle. Like these guys aren't, this just is one of the weaker running back depth charts in the league. And if nobody kind of establishes themselves as like the clear RB2, we could be looking at Cam Akers with like a 75, 80% carry share. And at that point, even on a bad Rams offense, he's probably finishing closer to RB12 than RB24. So I see some upside here, um, but the median outcome is probably still, you know, like a Marlon Mack, a peak Marlon Mack type season where he's just like a set it and forget it 13 points in your in your flex spot or your RB2 spot every week.
Uh, my RB20 is J.K. Dobbins. This is, uh, what, two spots below ADP, I think. I don't understand how he's supposed to finish as an RB1. And, and not that, I mean, obviously he's being drafted as the RB18 an underdog. It's not like he's being drafted as an RB1. But I see people hyping him up as if he has this RB1 upside, and I don't see it. Like, we've never, we've never seen J.K. Dobbins stay healthy under the burden of, like, a heavy workload in the NFL. It's like, it's literally never happened. Uh, we've never seen him be productive in the passing game in the NFL. Even going back to college, he had, you know, some 20 reception seasons. His share of the Ohio State passing game was very low. Like, he wasn't this, you know, no doubt receiving back coming out of college. He hasn't even been very involved in the passing game in the NFL. Like, I, I'm projecting him for easy career highs in both rushes per game and targets per game. But Todd Munkin is going to have the Ravens throwing the ball all over the field, more than they ever have with Lamar Jackson. The receiving core in Baltimore is more talented than it ever has been since they drafted J.K. Dobbins. Like, 200 carries, 1,000 rushing yards, 35 receptions, 8 touchdowns, right around there is kind of what I'm projecting for J.K. Dobbins, which puts him right around 13 points per game. That's a decent, nice little mid-RB2 season. But, like, is he just going to, like, make Gus Edwards go away, touch the ball 280 times on the ground, and catch 50 passes? Like, I I don't see the world in which that happens. I think Dobbins is pretty locked into, like, mid-level RB2-type production. My RB19 is Aaron Jones, who all indications are he's not ready to fall off the age cliff yet. He's still playing very well. Um, his efficiency numbers, his through-contact numbers are still good. So basically, I'm they're like there's not much to say about Aaron Jones. I'm betting that he does in 2023 basically the same thing that he's done in each of the last four or five seasons, and that's just produce efficiently on B tier volume with you know AJ Dillon eating into his workload a little bit. Um, it's just that this time he doesn't have a you know a first ballot Hall of Famer at quarterback. He has a first time starter at quarterback in Jordan Love. So the overall offensive productivity is probably going to fall a little bit. Probably not as many touchdown opportunities. Um, as he's had, you know, especially during his peak seasons when he was getting all the goal line work. But mid-level RB2 production for Aaron Jones feels like it's pretty locked in for this season, unless Jordan Love is just terrible. Uh, my RB18 is Damian Pierce. This is a little bit of, uh, above ADP. I could, you know, see myself coming down on this a little bit, uh, mostly because it's tough to know what to do uh, as far as distributing touches in this backfield with Devin Singletary now on the team. I'm currently projecting Damian Pierce for a 65% carry share and a 10% target share after he was at 86% and 9% respectively in those two categories last season. So a little bit, a little bit of a bump in the passing game, significant drop off in like his dominance of backfield carries with another, you know, decent NFL running back in Singletary now in the backfield. But I anticipate that this offense is going to run the ball more. Their pass run splits are going to lean a lot run heavier this season than they have in years past. Bobby Slowick is a, the new offensive coordinator is a Kyle Shanahan guy, plus a rookie quarterback in CJ Stroud, to me equals more team rushing volume, uh, which only helps Damian Pierce um, stack up, you know, rushing attempts, get touchdowns. He's not going to command a ton of receiving volume, but I see him just kind of, you know, brute forcing his way to an RB2 finish through a lot of rushing volume. Uh, my RB17 is Rashad White, and this is like eight spots ahead of ADP. I think he's currently being drafted as like the RB25. I'm not even a Rashad White guy. I liked him coming out of college, uh, but was kind of, you know, tentatively excited about his ability to run the football, considering that uh, he was super efficient in college, but level of competition, he was an older player. Like, there were just different factors that kind of indicated that maybe it was fool's gold efficiency in college from an athletic dude beating up on, you know, guys who were five years younger than he was uh, sometimes. It's just it's just hard to figure out how he doesn't produce like an RB2 this season, given that a, he was already a good receiver last year. Like he was running a, a, a decent array of routes, commanding targets at a high rate on a per route basis. You know, he was involved. He was running a lot of routes over. Like he was just good, especially for a rookie. And with no Leonard Fournette on the team, it seems like he'll be now unleashed in the passing game. I have him at a 12% target share. That doesn't seem like it's his ceiling. Like, I could see him getting more than that. And even though he was really bad on the ground, he averaged like 3.7 yards per carry, it seems like Tampa Bay is pretty intent on deploying him as their clear RB1, and there's not much behind him anyway. Like, Keyshawn Vaughn just got announced as, like, the clear RB2, but he's done nothing through, what, two or three seasons now in the NFL? We don't even know if Sean Tucker's healthy enough to play football. 
Chase Edmonds was terrible last year. Like, th there's just nobody in this backfield that seems equipped to take a bunch of volume from Rashad White, even though I don't think Rashad White's very good either. Uh, the downside here is that he sucks and somebody supplants him. But again, it's, it's, or at least eats into his workload significantly. But it's tough to figure out, like, where would that even be coming from? Like, Keyshawn Vaughn, I guess, maybe is secretly kind of good. Or maybe they bring Leonard Fournette. Like, they would have to do something, it seems... In the, something unexpected would have to happen in this backfield for Rashad White to not get a bunch of touches is basically what I'm saying. And if he's not quite as bad as the 3.7 yards per carry he posted as a rookie would indicate, then it's possible that he could flirt with like an RB1 finish on the basis of just like dominating touches as a Jag plus alone. Like if he's, if he's just an average NFL running back on a team with nobody else in the backfield pretty much he's he could get 75 receptions he could run the ball 250 times and even at you know 3.9 yards per carry four yards per carry he could he could finish as the rb 14 while not even being that good so i think i'm i don't, I don't even like rashad white i don't want to be the rashad white guy but i think he's being too disrespected in drafts right now because there's just not much else there to happen in the backfield other than rashad white getting the ball a lot my RB16 is James Conner. This is way ahead of ADP. I think he's being drafted as the RB26 right now. Uh, but I think the Cardinals are going to run the ball a lot. James Conner was good last year on a per carry basis. Uh, he's been decent in the passing game the last couple seasons, or really for, mu for much of his career. But I think the Cardinals are going to run a lot. Like, they potentially are missing Kyler Murray for a chunk of the season. Uh, new offensive coordinator is a Kevin Stefanski protege who worked with Stavansky on both the Browns and Vikings staffs in recent years. The last four years, teams that had Drew Petzing, the new offensive coordinator, teams where he was on the staff, finished 4th, 4th, ninth, and 5th in rushing attempts across the league. So if that if that's happening in Arizona with no Kyler Murray, it, it from there it's just a matter of James Conner staying healthy. Keontae Ingram is his best competition for touches in the backfield. I like Keonta Ingram. I was a Keonta Ingram guy last offseason. He was bad as a rookie, so who knows if he's good enough to take away touches. And James Conner's currently being drafted, again, as the RB26. You don't have to take him anywhere near the RB, you know, mid-RB2 range in order to bet on mid-RB2 level production from him. You can just wait until he falls to RB24, RB25, take him a couple players ahead of ADP, and you got yourself, you know, a solid RB2 who could, you know, maybe give you even better production than that. His 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 splits without Kyler Murray have been pretty nice uh, in the last couple seasons. My RB15 is Travis Etienne. I have Etienne adding two points per game to what he did last season, based mostly on a slight increase in rushing volume and a regression to the mean in touchdown rate. Last season, he was 44th out of 69 running backs with at least 50 carries in touchdown rate. He was not scoring a lot. I anticipate that will, you know, kind of correct itself. Um, he could rip off some long touchdowns. He punches in a few more at the goal line. You know, whatever. If he gets closer to, like, league average in touchdown rate, he'll score a few more. I also see him running the ball a few more times because he was really good on a per-carry basis last season. I think he earned himself more volume. But unless Tank Bigsby is just completely undeserving of, like, breather back touches behind ETN, I think they're going to try to insert him... At the goal line, he's he's kind of like a big bruising. I mean, he's similar size to ETN, but like stylistically, he's he's kind of a bruiser, um, at least more than ETN is. I don't think I wrote I wrote an article about this over at NoMoreParties.com um, earlier this offseason, but I don't think Tink Bigsby is particularly good in the passing game. But I also don't think Travis ETN is particularly good in the passing game. I think the Jaguars know that Travis ETN is not particularly good in the passing game, and I think they're going to try to see if Tink Bigsby can be functional in the passing game. So I don't see Travis Etienne like improving upon his receiving numbers from last season. A little more rushing volume, a few more touchdowns. He gets a little bit better, you know, high-end RB2. Uh, my RB14 is Joe Mixon. Gross. Nobody's excited to draft Joe Mixon at this point. I am I am no different than you. Uh, but it's also kind of hard to know what else to do with him. Like, with Samaj P. Ryan gone, it's all unproven guys behind him. It's Chase Brown. It's Travion Williams. It's, uh, what the fuck's the other guy's name? Michigan, Chris Evans, his name's Chris Evans. Those guys are all unproven, so it seems like Joe Mixon is going to get a ton of volume again, like a lot of work between the 20s, a lot of work at the goal line. Uh, he was, you know, career highs in receiving work last year. Doesn't seem like there's a huge reason for that to undo itself this season. And so in, in that scenario where he's getting a ton of volume in each of those key areas, 
even at sub four yards per carry, that equals fringy RB1 numbers on a great team, on a great offense like the Bengals. I'm treating Joe Mixon like he's Rashad White on a better offense this year. And if Rashad White was the lead back for the Bengals, like he'd be almost an auto RB1. The risk with Joe Mixon is that he is cooked or that he, you know, Travion Williams or Chase Brown or whoever it ends up being eats into more of the work. But like, I, I don't know. It just seems like this is a pretty safe spot for Joe Mixon, given that he can just absorb a bunch of touches, be a blah player on a per down basis, but, you know, ride a great offense to a decent fantasy finish regardless. Uh, and then my RB13 is Derrick Henry. I talked about him in the last video. Um, you all loved my Derrick Henry take. He's a superhuman who will never get worse at football. Uh, the Titans uh, have been bad lately, but they're not going to be bad anymore because they drafted Peter Skaronsky in the first round. So I'm projecting Derrick Henry for another 2,000 yard rushing season and an RB13 finish. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe. Uh, I don't know. See you next week. Peace. <laughs>